Good afternoon, everyone. Excellent. Thanks so much for coming along to um, the second in our seminar series, the Queensland Genomics Health Alliance seminar series. Um, thank you, Simon, for, for coming up and, and speaking to everybody here. Um, today's event was brought to you uh, by a partnership between um, Queensland Genomics Health Alliance, Pathology Queensland, and the Australasian Society of Diagnostic Genomics. And Charmaine, wherever she is, is here from uh, ASDG as one of her hats. Um, if anyone wants to talk to her about um, membership. <laughs> so that's the plug. Um, I'd just like to hand over to Greg Pratt, who is the um, on the Queensland Genomics Health Alliance community group, um, and he will do our welcome to country. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Now, look, in accordance with uh, protocol for the area, um, I myself am not a traditional owner of the land where we meet today, but I am a traditional owner for the Kwandamuka people of Moreton Bay. So in accord with protocol, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we meet today, that being the Turrbal and the Yagara people, and also to introduce myself as an Aboriginal man. And I said, I come from the Kwandamuka people of Stradbroke Island, specifically the Nunnuckle people um, and the Brown family. And I. Uh, I grew up in far north Queensland with the Kuku Yalanji and the Kuku Taipan people. So thank you for coming. Um, what I would like to do is, as well as, is to pay homage to elders past and present and those amongst us and with our, our various teams who are likely to be people of significance going forward. So in acknowledging the tradition of this country and the long heritage that we have as 60,000 years worth of, of uh, history uh, this is a very important space for us to be engaged with. And so if you have the opportunity over the next couple of hours to think about the relevance of this particular work as it applies to that priority group that are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Queenslanders and more broadly Australians, that would be wonderful. So thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my job today is to just introduce the Queensland Genomics Health Alliance. Uh, so most of you would be familiar with the Alliance and the funding we have from Queensland Health and the mission of the organisation, um, which is to demonstrate the value of genomics in everyday healthcare uh, and to improve the health of Queenslanders. Um, our Alliance will drive collaboration between the state's health system and our research and academic communities. Um, so, um, a quick overview of the Queensland Genomics Health Alliance program. Um, look, the key strategic things is where the funding goes into the program, because that's the work we're able to revolve around with the project. So we have three rounds of funding. Uh, our first round of funding kicked off last year, um, and that, uh, under that program logic, we uh, funded four clinical demonstration projects. Uh, so one of them was around lung cancer, another was around melanoma, another around MODI, which is mature onset diabetes in the young, and the fourth was around infectious disease control. Um, in addition to those four clinical demonstration projects, we funded five capability building work streams, um, and they were around ethics, legal, and social implications for genomics, uh, the evaluation of clinical genomics, workforce issues uh, for genomics and for the broader clinical community, um, genomic information management, and finally, genomic testing and innovation. And John is gonna get up in a minute and talk about that particular work stream. So I won't go into much more detail, but it's very relevant. And, and Simon, the opportunity to have him here and to speak to us all has been uh, really great. Um, so that's really the nature of this first round of funding. Uh, our next round of funding comes up towards the end of this year, and we're currently working with government around how we design that program uh, and how that investment would flow. And our third round of funding, uh, which will take us through to 2021, which is the end of the Alliance program. So our job and the small team we have in the Alliance is to really um, do ourselves out of a job and leave the health system and the research and academic system in a much better position to continue to deal with, um, uh, I guess, the, the ongoing innovation and disruption that genomics is having, not only for patients and clinicians and the health system, but for the research system as well. Uh, so we're very, very keen to enable that. So thank you very much for your attendance today, and I'll hand over to John now. David, and uh, also welcome to everyone who's come. 
Um, this was really just a brief, I give uh, Sunil's apologies. He's the, he's the, the PI on this, this project. He's somewhere overseas, a project lead. So really the summary of that was building on a statewide network of PQ Pathology Queensland and the project will focus on development and impl implementation of quality management systems for genomic sample collection, processing, tracking and timely delivery of reports to the clinic, which fits in with an ISO standard and work with other capability building work streams and clinical demonstration projects. And there are some of the objectives that uh, were put forward. And again, underneath is some of the uh, organisations that are involved uh, within that uh, project. Um, this is really just a plug for, there's a survey coming around. I'm going to do two plugs, probably. One is a genomics testing innovation capability survey. It's going to be coming around. I'm not sure how this is going to integrate now into something I heard about yesterday. Um, which you may not be aware of. Um, the Commonwealth Department of Health is part of their looking at genomics around Australia is wanting to do a survey or a stock take, and this is being uh, done by the RCPA. Um, so that will actually involve a lot of research on laboratories. I've only just heard the details. We have a very short, short timeline, so you may well be hearing from us about this uh, to fill out this survey in the future. But there is another innovation capability survey that will go out at that time, which I don't think will be as, um, as extensive as the, the further one coming from the College of Pathologists on behalf of the Department of Health. So this is certainly to be released and to just to determine the genomics capabilities of Queensland laboratories and to identify a streamlined process of their validation, accreditation and sharing of resources and hopefully this won't be uh, too taxing. Um, there is this, this survey has been uh, developed on, based on the impact guidelines for MPS and incorporates other Australian international standards and just to identify the strengths and opportunities for improvement in Queensland genomics and we hope we can uh, encourage you to share your policies, resources and opinions and your participation is valued and that survey is coming around soon. Uh, next I'd like to introduce uh, Simon Patton. Uh, Simon, and get to the next piece of paper, is going to come and talk to us about uh, quality assurance or how good is your next generation sequencing. Uh, Simon is based in Manchester, United Kingdom, where he directs the UPM Molecular Genetics Quality Network within the Manchester Centre for Genomic Medicine. The MQN is a global leader in the provision of external quality assessment EQA schemes to diagnostic laboratories in the field of genetics and pathology, and many of you involved in laboratories are probably participants in the surveys that um, Simon's group uh, provides. It was established in 1998 after a successful pilot trial of hunting disease, EQA, um, the previous year, and from up until 2002, the network was supported by a grant from the European Commission under the Standards Measurement and Testing Program. I won't mention the contract number. Uh, since then, it's been, it's been supported by subscriptions from EQA scheme participants, that's us, and currently EMQN offers molecular genetics, molecular pathology and technique-specific EQA schemes for molecular testing. So Simon's work is focused on global improvement in the standards and quality of diagnostic laboratory testing. And certainly the EQN, EMQN has gone a long way to look, uh, providing information and education to many of the laboratories, and particularly our laboratories as well as has benefited by that. And also depend on many of the uh, many scientists and, and clinicians who are involved voluntarily in his the report productions. So here's Simon's interested in genetics, quality and healthcare, accreditation, standardisation of laboratory testing, and best practice guidelines. Trained at the University of Liverpool in marine biology before doing his directorate, doctorate in genetics at the University of Cambridge. So Simon's already been in Australia for about um, a week or so. Uh, noticed some of the rain when he first came. Um, it's still humid for him and he's moving down to, been down to Sydney. I think he's going to Melbourne tonight and then on to New Zealand later. So he's having a, a world tour down, down under. So please put your hands together. Welcome Simon uh, for his uh, presentation. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much indeed to John and particularly Val, who I've known Val for quite a few years now uh, um, for the invitation, but also specifically to uh, Queensland Genomic Health Alliance, um, the ASDG, Pathology Queensland, uh, Katrina and Rachel. Thank you very much indeed for all your work as well. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, diagnostic next generation sequencing, but actually the questions I'm going to hopefully raise for you are equally applicable whether you work in a research or a diagnostic environment. Um, 
So I'm, I'm predominantly going to talk about the activities we've been developing over the last five years for looking at the quality of next generation sequencing data. And hopefully it'll raise some issues for you, some thoughts about what you should and shouldn't be doing uh, in, your, in your day to day routine work using next generation sequencing. So as John quite rightly said, my, that's, that's the horrendous acronym that you have to come up with when you're developing a European project grant. Uh, I've just preferred to say EMQN because it's a lot less of a mouthful. But we are a, an international quality assurance provider in the fields of genetics, pathology, and uh, technical processes relating to molecular diagnostic testing. Um, we, if you look at our sort of workflow, if you like, our day-to-day our, our -day workload, about 60% of our workload really comes from sort of traditional inherited genetics, germline genetics, uh, and then the rest of it comes from somatic test testing and from technical processes. But I think we would all acknowledge that the, the landscape of uh, genomics is changing, and we're seeing a lot more of this, this area than we are of the sort of growth in this area. So although there's a lot of rare disease testing by, on their own, each disease is relatively rare, as it, obviously, the cancer side of things is increasing massively, and we see that reflected in our workload. We uh, started in 1997, as John said, and we are modelled on a, 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 a UK uh, organisation called the UK, UK National External Quality Assessment Schemes, which essentially is a, a similar mimic to what we do. Uh, we were spun out, if you like, of a UK initiative that was only able to serve the UK, Ireland and the Netherlands in terms of laboratory services. Uh, so we had a, a European uh, funding, uh, round of funding in, in 1997, finished in 2002, and now we are entirely self-financing. Uh, we have a global remit of, uh, and a global network of laboratories, about 2,000 laboratories around, around the world, 67 different countries represented. And we are ourselves, like many diagnostic laboratories, also accredited. So we have to meet a certain set of set standards for our provision of our activities to our laboratories. Um, and I, I would add to this that although we have about 2,000 laboratories, we have in Manchester the, the sort of coordinating centre of our activities, 10 full-time staff, uh, so it's not very big. And it's often a surprise, particularly if you come from the College of American Pathology, that we can deliver quite so much on such a short, small number of staff. Um, but that's uh, doing a disservice to the 200-plus colleagues around the world who actually helped contribute to our activities. So... They don't get paid for it, if you like, um, but it's really those 200, those 200 colleagues that actually help deliver our services. And I'd like to, to say a special thanks to them because it's, it's important to us that they, they are on board with our activities. So I'm not sure how familiar uh, you are with what external quality assessment is, so I've got the obligatory single slide just to explain what the process is. But the principle is pretty, is pretty straightforward. It's... Provide, a provision of every laboratory gets provided with the same sample, the same clinical sample. It could be a DNA sample, it could be a tumour sample, whatever. But everybody gets the same starting material. And with it comes a clinical referral for a particular disorder, for example, breast cancer. The labs test it and they can test it however they like. Uh, and then they report their results back to us. And usually they report back the results in the form of a clinical case uh, report. Um, I, I, I often think this is an irony, but when laboratories get our samples, they get usually three samples a year, and we expect them to treat them like any other patient sample, but what normally happens is they spend a lot of more time <laughs> treating these EQA samples, more care than they would do in a, in a real clinical sample. It's an irony, but it's true. Um, our, 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 we take their results, and we then compare them, determine the accuracy of their uh, uh, testing process, against every other laboratory. So if you like, what we're trying to do is benchmark your performance against the community of other laboratories doing the same thing as you. Uh, and it's also, I think, often underrated, but certainly something we try and strive to do, which is also to help educate laboratories. So it's not just about regulation, and regulation, as you see here, does play a part in our activities, but really education is key to what we do. So uh, from our activities, we really want to provide laboratories with information that helps to improve their testing processes. Uh, and we're always open, if you like, to, to, to dialogue with laboratories if you need any more information. But we hope that we provide enough to, to, to help you uh, undertake a, an improvement in your service. Now, in this area of, of genomic testing, it's now possible, and we, we had a discussion about this at lunchtime, to sequence, a, for many clinical labs, to sequence a genome. Uh, 
the, uh, the, the data that's banded around, it costs $1,000 to sequence the genome, but I th we think it's realistically much more than that, close to four or $5,000 to sequence a genome. Nevertheless, it is possible to sequence a genome in a clinical scenario. But of course, it's more than that, because we need to make sure that we sequence it properly and get the right result for the patient. What we're all trying to do is get the right result for the right patient in the right time. Any errors that we do make can have unfortunate consequences for that patient. So we could, it could lead to the abortion of a healthy fetus or the birth, an unexpected birth of an affected child. We could make inappropriate reproductive decisions or inappropriate prophylactic surgery undertaken. Or we could fail to provide the most effective treatment for that patient. So our, our remit as clinical laboratories is to make sure we get the right result for the right patient in the right time. So I'm going to tell you a story. So this good-looking bloke on the right is my brother, my younger brother. And two years ago, he was involved in a car accident whilst out riding his bike. And he was critically injured in the process and spent 10 weeks in intensive care. To get to this stage now, two years later, it's required an enormous team, set of teamwork from both the doctors and the paramedics that scraped him off, off the ground, to the ICU unit who looked after him and nursed him for 10 weeks, to the physios, etc., that helped get him back on his feet, and to his family who got to that stage. Now, I tell you this not because I want sympathy, but I tell you it because developing what we're doing now for next generation sequencing is a is a battle of immense proportions, as significant as, as, as my brother's travel or journey through his recovery from his injury. The challenges we face as next generation sequence, as providers of EQA for next generation sequencing, are significant. So, in the clinical, in the community at the moment, there's no, still really no consensus of how, how best to do the type of testing. So, we're all still testing panels, we're doing genomes, we're doing exomes. We're working in an environment where there's a rapidly changing technology environment. So we're still we're on second, third generation technologies. And there's also relatively quick transition uh, research to do diagnostics. But it's still difficult. And it's difficult to make it cost effective. So we all know it's expensive to do next generation sequencing. It's also very expensive for us to provide it. And if we provide a quality assurance scheme, we need to make sure that you can afford to participate in it. And I think another key thing that's often overlooked is there's still really no best practice guidelines about how best to do this type of testing in the clinical environment. Um, so th there are now guidelines for on implementing oncology panels, validation of oncology panels, published recently by Larry Jennings and co. In the, in the States, but there's still nothing in the germline setting. So our challenges for our activities were really to establish an EQA scheme that was platform agnostic it needs to be able to work on any type of platform. Um, we need to be able to establish proficiency of laboratories using, uh, working in genomes, exomes, panels. It really doesn't matter whether they work in the fields of genetics or oncology. And it could equally be in the fields of infectious diseases, virology, whatever. Um, we also need to make sure that we test the whole process the laboratory is going through, not just the bioinformatics. Um, it's very crucial, but it's not the only part. The laboratories are still doing wet lab testing. So we need to fit in with the wet lab process as well as bioinformatics. And lastly, we need to make sure that any activities we develop fit in seamlessly within your laboratory processes. So this is, this is work that's bigger than one organization. We realized this very quickly that we couldn't do it on our own in, in isolation. So everything I'm going to be telling you today is really not just done by EMQN. It's actually done by our, our, ourselves and our partners, the UK Nequest for Molecular Genetics. And it's definitely a collaborative organisation, perhaps or a collaborative process and project, uh, and it could not have been delivered without working together. But more importantly, we re realised very quickly that we couldn't do it without the scientific expertise that we need as well. So we established a specialist advisory group made up of uh, scientists, predominantly scientists, but now also bioinformaticians and statisticians who have been involved in the process of implementing next generation sequencing, certainly in, in Europe. We started off in the UK, which is why there's a preponderance, if you like, of UK expertise. But now we're building on that with expertise from, from Europe as well, from both Belgium and the Netherlands. 
But these are a group of individuals who've been working in this field for a long time and have expertise in the key areas. So when we started out, we go back to 2013 here, we started out, we started out with the premise that we could do this, it was easy. We, had, we thought it was going to be straightforward to do. Well, we didn't, but we did think it was going to be relatively straightforward to do. Um, we started out with the idea of sending out a single genomic DNA sample. Now, we, as EQA providers, we have thousands of samples in our cell bank in Manchester, over a thousand samples for different genetic disorders with the consent, appropriate consent, et cetera, to use them for most things that we really would need to for our activities. And we asked the laboratories to test that genomic sample using their normal procedures. So we're not specifying how they do it. We just said they should test it using their normal procedures. Uh, they could test it by their smallest panel, by, uh, by a number of genes, or their largest gene, for example. But it's up to them how they did it. And then they report the data back to us. Now, we learned a number of things from this. I'm not going to go into the details of this EQA scheme. But the, the, things, the lessons we learned, if you like, were two things. That we, because we had a small number of laboratories involved, just 24, I think it was, any errors that we made or they made were magnified just because of the small sample size. And the most significant thing we learned from this was that we need to understand the sample we're sending out to the laboratories. And I think all of you in the field of this, this field will be familiar with using reference materials. Uh, and so many of you will be familiar with using the samples provided by NIST in the States, the genome in the bottle samples. Highly characterized, high confidence calls on most of the variants. Those are samples that make fantastic reference materials for you developing your assays and validating them. But they make absolutely no sense to us in the field of EQA because you already know what you're testing when you get that sample. We need to challenge you with something that you're not familiar with. So it's no good for us using a genome in a bottle sample. So our biggest challenge, if you like, is understanding the consensus and writing our own reference that we then send around to every laboratories. And I'll talk a lot more about this later on, about how important that is and what we've been able to do to improve that process. So we learned from that in the second year and we invested heavily in prior characterization of our control samples. So we involved the manufacturers, both Illumina and Life Technologies, uh, and they sequenced sequenced our samples to death. We had four samples. We had both Illumina, exome, and genome sample, uh, testing, and likewise for life technologies. And what we did was we established a consensus EQA genome, if you like, so we were confident of concordant data between at least two out of the four different technologies that we could say with reasonable confidence that those 15,000 variants, and I know that number's not high, but it wasn't bad at the time, that those 15,000 variants were present in that sample that we tested. We also learned quite a lot else. So we knew we needed to improve on the concordance data, uh, and we definitely got better consensus from the laboratory. So when we looked at any particular gene, let's just take BRCA gene, the BRCA genes. What we're trying to do is establish, if you test the BRCA gene, does everybody else who tests that sample find the same variants that you do? So is the variant calling for the BRCA genes concordant between every laboratory? So when we had a small sample size of 24 laboratories, only about 50% of all the variants detected were concordant between any lab testing the same gene. By 2014, we had a larger sample size, 150 labs. You can see actually that the data was looking much more promising. And this is really to do with the fact that we'd done the prior validation of the sample. We knew what we were sending around to the laboratories. But we also uncovered another problem. And that problem was that 70% of our time in this scheme is 150 laboratories all submitting one data set from uh, whether it be a panel or it could be a, an exome. It wasn't genomes at the time, but certainly exomes. 70% of our time was spent manipulating that data so we could then compare it against everybody else. This really comes down to the fact of lack of standardization of, of data standards, and I'll talk again more about that later on. But clearly, that's not something that's sustainable long-term for, for our activities. We're never going to be able to compare data from large numbers of labs unless there's some way of comparing it easily. So we realized we needed more bioinformatics support. And another thing we learned was, it's, it's intuitive, I suppose, and obvious, really, is that obviously there are two different communities of laboratories. We have those testing the blood samples and those testing the tumor samples. And obviously their needs are different, both in terms of coverage and depth of sequencing. So for our 
genome germline scheme, we were quite confident, if you like, that sending a genomic DNA sample was a, was a viable way of providing this EQA scheme to every laboratory. The same sample distributed to every laboratory uh, in a format they could all use. That's not so easy with a somatic scheme. And we've tried over the years different ways of providing materials to these laboratories. So the first year we sent genomic DNA extracted from a reference material provided by a commercial manufacturer. So this was a mixed population of different cell lines with uh, mutations in oncogenes in about 10 or 15 oncogenes that were relevant to what most laboratories were testing for somatic mutations. It worked, but because there were population, it was a mixed population of cells, the data weren't fantastic in terms of looking at the, the variant calls between the different cell types. The second year, we sent an FFPE sample from a single cell line. So the single cell line is great, but the FFP sample made it difficult for some laboratories to get usable amounts of DNA. We all know that that's a challenging process at the best of times. And last year, I think we hit upon probably what is the most effective way of providing this scheme. So we sent gDNA extracted from a real tissue FFP, real tumor sample that's been through the FFP process. So it's more closely mimicking a real, tum a real tumor sample. And lastly, the lessons learned. The last thing we learned is that we can't do it without bioinformatics support. For the first two years, we really struggled to be able to collate the data and interpret the data just because when you're working within the public health system and certainly in the UK is no better than probably than anywhere else, um, we don't have access to good bioinformatics support and we don't have access to methodologies for sharing big data. Uh, we really needed some expertise. So we partnered with a, a Finnish company called Uformatics, and their specialist interest is data, big data, related to next generation sequencing. And so with them, we develop, developed a platform that's going to help us to do this process. Uh, and we're now able to collect very big data sets uh, from multiple results submissions from each laboratory, up to three different results submissions for each laboratory. And importantly, we're able to triage the data before it comes to us. So we're able to understand whether the files meet our requirements before we do any downstream analysis, taking out that 70% time that we spent previously. Uh, we can automate the, we automate the data analysis in real time. And on top of that, we can also do not just the concordance data, looking at consensus between every variant, but also a whole suite of different quality metrics that are important for providing good quality sequencing data. So the rest of my talk is really about the data, the results we found from this activity. Uh, and I'm going to structure it really around the, some general themes we've pulled out from it and then talk about some specifics as well. So the sequencing strategies used, it's interesting looking at the data from 2016. So this is the last set of data we have. 2017 data has not been reported yet. But we had uh, 300 and... Um, I can't remember what it was now, 340 plus data sub submissions uh, for our, in fact, it's more than that, it's 360 odd data submissions for our germline scheme, of which uh, 315 of them were targeted approaches, another 44 laboratories submitted whole exome data, and a further 15 laboratories submitted whole genome data. So you can start to see there's a lot of big data being, being collected here. In our somatic mutation scheme, where we have slightly low, where we have considerably lower sample numbers in terms of laboratories, we're still getting a large proportion submitting targeted tests and a very small proportion submitting whole exome data. And one lab submitted a whole cancer genome. When you look at the genes that people are testing, so the most commonly tested genes are nearly always onc oncogenes. Uh, the BRCA1 and 2 genes are the most frequently tested genes by all of the laboratories. Um, but this data is now no longer relevant because we've got so much data being collected here. But BRCA1 and 2 still remain the most commonly tested genes by our laboratories. When you look at the platforms laboratories are using, you see a divergence between those doing the germline testing and the somatic mutation testing. So in the germline setting, most laboratories, 60, well, no, more than 65, 70% 65, 70 of laboratories are using an Illumina platform. Whilst in the somatic context, 40% of laboratories are using an iron torrent platform. I think, if I look at some heads here, this probably reflects what you understand in terms of your testing processes. Many labs doing somatic testing are preferring to use the iron torrent type platforms. 
And when you look at the reportable coverage, you can see the nice separation between those labs doing germline testing and those labs doing uh, somatic mutation testing. Again, reflecting the different context of the, set, the, 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 the uh, testing process itself. When you start to look at other details about the specifics about the bioinformatics laboratories you're using, let's take aligners, for example. So we all, do, we all require an aligner to actually align the sequence to actually do the data analysis. And what we've seen over the years is a, a propor, a, the increasing proportion or reliance of laboratories using one type of aligner. So in 2017, our data shows that 87% of laboratories were using a burrows wheelers aligner for doing their analysis. And you can see every year this has grown. So 87 this year, about uh, four, uh, seven, uh, 45, no, uh, what does it say? can't see it now. 74%, sorry, 74% using it in, in 2015 and just a bit more using it in 2016. So you see a big reliance on, on one particular type of aligner. Likewise, if you look at the variant callers, we see the same reliance on one particular variant caller. So GATK is becoming increasingly used by all laboratories. So why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant because these tools were never developed in a diagnostic setting. They were never developed to be used in clinical diagnostics. They came from research, and yet we have a preponderance of usage of these tools in the clinical setting. And I think that's important because we need to be cognizant of the fact that there's an inbuilt bias, if you like, in these tools. We need to be aware of the fact that we're not using tools that were ever developed for the use in the clinical scenarios. When you start to look at the variant calling data, we find some interesting results. So this is looking at, remember, it came back to the previous, one of the previous slides, which is looking, if you test BRCA, do you find the same variants that everybody else has tested? We're now able, because we've got such a large data set, to compare uh, and look at the sensitivity and precision of the assays that the laboratories are developing. So if we take, for example, mapped against chromosome 37 submissions, 92% of laboratories achieved a sensitivity of greater than 80%. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the later genome reference, genome 38, 78% of laboratories also achieved a sensitivity of greater than 80%. If you look at the precision of the results, 94% achieved a precision of greater than 80% or 86 using genome 38. And this is plotted here. So you could, I guess, plot every single point. And what you'd see in a, in a, in a plot, you see most laboratories aggregating at the top with 100% or close to 100%. Here it's just reflected this way around in a bar, in a bar chart. But there are always outliers. So why are there outliers? Well, these are outliers because not because the laboratories are doing a poor job, but because when they submit their data, they're not excluding the genes they haven't tested. So our analysis relies on looking at the, the comparison against variants being detected. We're not able to exclude that data, and therefore they map down as the 0 to, 0 to 5 percent concordance. The data is somewhat more sketchy from the, from the somatic mutation testing. And this really reflects the fact there's a smaller sample pool of laboratories. And also, it's much harder to map the consensus before you do the analysis. So again, 65% of submissions achieved a sensitivity greater than 80% for somatic and 55% for precision greater than 80%. But again, it's much more variable, as I talked about. We're also able to start looking at how we, report that, how we report that information back to the laboratories, because if you participate in the EK, what you want to gain from it is knowledge that allows you to improve your processes. So we provide a report back to the laboratories that provides a, a summary of their variant calling data. Um, and in, in 2013 to 2016, we based this data analysis on that reference that we told you about, the, the, the prior validation of the sample, established consensus data, mapped the laboratory's results against it. Because we have so many labs now participating, 300 plus laboratories, we now don't need to do that prior validation because we're confident that we can now establish consensus from the laboratory's data themselves. We don't need to actually sequence the samples beforehand. So uh, we are able to measure the laboratory's performance against themselves, against the consensus established from the laboratories. And it's our intention to actually provide this information back to you as a community, as a VCF file uh, that you can use. 
Now, in, 20, in 2017, the sample we provided to the laboratories was taken from the Personal Genome Project, publicly available samples from a public database with public data about the variant calling files from it. You can now take that file from us, the VCF file, which we can provide you and will provide to the laboratory, and use it in your validation process to start looking and validating your assays against a new reference sequence. So from the laboratory's perspective, what we provide them back with is a report, and that report talks about the true positives and true false, false, true positives, true false, false positives, false negatives, sensitivity, and also precision. It's not on this slide, but the precision as well. And what we do is we list every variant detected by that laboratory for every gene they tested, the genotype they submitted, uh, and this is data from when we were talking about 2016, so we also have our EQA genotype from our validation beforehand, and the consensus ratio is the four out of four validating labs picked up that, that genotype. From the participant consensus ratio, this is the new data, we're able to see that 50, 48 out of 51 laboratories testing that variant detected that genotype as well. And so the lab's results agree with our consensus data and our EQA sample data. And you can start to use that to go down and look at all the variants and look for uh, regions where you might not have concordance with our data and try to understand why um, you didn't detect those variants in the first place. But this is not an easy thing to do. There's a massive problem around um, creating consensus. Uh, and so it, it, it's, it, it's driven by a, a number of factors relating to the sequence itself, but requiring massive amounts of, comp of, of data analysis and algorithms to sort of standardize how we actually count those variants. Um, it's very hard to, to define and interpret the results, such as precision and sensitivity. Um, the performance of each individual NGS assay can vary, um, so we need to understand the performance uh, for every laboratory using every particular assay. And establishing high confidence calls is really difficult to do. Um, and what is truth? How do we establish truth? And what we've been trying to do in our EQA scheme is to try to establish what is the truth for every variant. And it's interesting to know that this was recently picked up by the Global Health Alliance, or Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, who've written a paper and set a stand set of standards, best practices for benchmarking germline small variant calls in human genome. And this was only published, I think, two, two weeks ago. And it's worth you looking at this if you're interested in this area about how you establish consensus between data. If we look at some of the other data we've got about quality of, the quality of the sequencing data that the laboratory is producing. We've got some interesting data on the, the quality, FRAG quality scores. So here we're looking at the quality of data from each sequencer, each platform, for a score, FRAG quality score of 30. You can see we're now able to start looking, ranking data from the different sequences based on the quality of data they produce from their analysis. Finally, the last thing we're able to do is start to benchmark laboratories' data quality. So this will start to allow you to, 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 to see, if I've used platform A, so MySeq here, and I use this, this capture kit, the Illumina Next Era capture kit, how many other labs use that same combination? So we can see that 139 labs use the MySeq in this, on this sample, of which 10 of them use the same capture kit. From that, we start to look at particular metrics associated with data quality. So there are guides, best practice guidelines available, certainly from the European Society of Human Genetics is one provider, that set a common set of data standards, quality metrics that you should be looking at and measuring and in trying to improve your data and out your data quality. So here we've focused on those, those metrics. So we've looked at the BAM file data. So we've been comparing the uniformity of calls, the off targets, uh, the error rate on target, the coverage at 20 and 30x, the insert size, both the average and the standard deviation. And what we can now do, because we know how many labs have used the same platform, is we can start to, to, to benchmark your performance, the black dot, against the population of the population laboratories, so the blue areas define the interquartile ranges. The black band here defines the medium values submitted by those labs using that combination of chemistries. And this whole data provides the whole range of sample reports submitted by the laboratories. We can do that for those seven metrics for BAM files. We also do it for the FASTQ files, where we're looking at all the FRED quality scores at 20 and 30, 
and the average base quality score. And again, you can see how your laboratory ranks compared to the population laboratories using your same sequencer. And finally, with the VCF file, the variant calling, again, we can start to benchmark your performance against everybody else using the same technology for a number of different quality metrics. So over time, we've seen a big increase in laboratory participation, so a large demand for this type of activity, mainly coming from the diagnostic laboratories, but I would like to see more research laboratories feeding into this data set. The more labs we have, uh, the more confidence we can be, be confident we can become on the data analysis itself, and particularly when we're writing a reference sequence, we need bigger, bigger numbers of laboratories to be more accurate in our data analysis. But you see there's a big demand. Uh, and we have a, a global rate network of laboratories, and it's nice to see so many labs from Australia representing, uh, compared to our American, North American colleagues, there's half as many uh, laboratories. But the bulk of what we do, if you like, is, still reflects our European nature of provision. So in conclusion, I think what we've, I've hopefully demonstrated to you is that we've developed a mechanism for looking at next generation sequencing quality that's generic, it's independent of the technology laboratories use, independent of the testing context that they work in, and hopefully fits seamlessly with your, your workflows. We're able to look at both the wet laboratory processes and the bioinformatics side of things, but there's still many challenges for us. So there's a challenge around material provisions, particularly within the somatic scheme, um, a real challenge around getting uniform results from laboratories, uh, and data standardization is a key issue. We have a big problem with data standardization uh, for, for this activity. Uh, I'll just put one more slide just to, to go through that. Uh, we have an issues related to bioinformatics analysis, which I think we're overcoming. And lastly, because we're an EQA provider, we need to provide some sort of measure of performance. And at the moment, we haven't established any way of measuring performance between laboratories in this analysis process. So if you're interested, uh, this is the websites of the two EQA providers providing, providing this scheme. So my last remark really relates to truly harmonized data standards. If we are going to share as a community in the genomics world our data, and we're going to develop sharing of information about variant calling and sequence files and uh, improve our communication between laboratories, we need truly harmonized standards of data. At the moment, whilst there are data standards, particularly let's take the example of variant call files, there is a standard for variant call files. But that standard is actually deliberately written to be slightly woolly. So there is interpretations of the same standard from different manufacturers. We're never going to be able to be truly automate our analysis processes and our data sharing until we start from a premise that we're all working from the same information. So this, if you like, is a call from, for us as a community, but also to the manufacturers of all these technologies to start to work together about really trying to improve data standardization. So I know you as a group of laboratories are going through the process of uh, looking at your, your, your activities uh, and data sharing is part of that process. I'd emphasize the importance of making sure you've got standardization of your data. You know what you're sharing between yourselves. <laughs> So finally, just a few acknowledgements. So there's my team in Manchester, and Veronica is the lead scientist on the Next Generation Sequencing team, and the UK NEQAS team in Edinburgh. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the, the bioinformatics guys in, in, in Finland, Euformatics, Christoph and Yuka, and the members of the scientific advisory group, because we couldn't have de developed the CQA without their advice and, and contrib contribution. And finally, to all the centers and, and manufacturers that have been involved in the validation process over the years. Again, we could not have achieved uh, what we've done so far without their, their contribution. Thank you very much indeed. So thanks very much, Simon. Um, can I open that up to any, any questions from the floor? We have a couple of roving mics. We actually are recording this session with uh, four others who may not have been able to make that. So please, please use the microphones. Stunned with silence. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> challenges. That's a challenge. I've never seen such a quick response to a challenge. Uh, thanks for that. So my, my first question is the difference in results with the different genome assemblies, 38 versus mm. 37. So then, and 
if I remember the slide, it was worse with the newer genome assembly, yeah. is that right? Uh, I'm just a bit curious about that interpretation, because you'd assume that the newer assembly would then therefore be the better You would, but not many labs are using the newer assembly, so that's the part of the problem, is the fact there's a bias in there, because actually a very, only a very small number of labs reported the data using the newer assembly. Uh, and uh, actually, how you call that consensus is really difficult. It's about the number of the cutoffs we use to actually say what is consensus, whether you say 75% of calls are consensus or 50%. So the data looks slightly different if you go 50%. We're using a 75% of all calls being consistent for consensus. If you go down to 50%, the data actually looks a lot nicer, but I'm arguing whether 50% is really the right consensus call. And that's where that genomic health, that genomic alliance data is quite interesting because they've established a suite of tools now that we maybe can look at using and more consistent. So we're all talking from the same the same starting point. So uh, I've got a question about this standardization issue. So you mentioned standardization of, of data. What about standardization of qu the quality assurance process? I mean, you've yeah. got a system, each country, even within the UK, presumably there'll be different quality assurers. Mm -hmm. Is there a network? Is there an international consensus about you know, uh, a, a st an, an international stamp of approval of, yes, this has been quality assured and you can rely on it whether it's done in Finland or Botswana or Australia? There's an international standard every quality assurance provider has to meet. If They don't all have to meet it, but we all try to aim to that. So that's the ISO standard, the 17043. Uh, there is a network of laboratories sharing information, sorry, EQA providers sharing information for certain disciplines. But in next generation sequencing, we, are, we and CAP are the only two providers doing this. And the reason is it's really not very easy to do. Um, and CAP, CAP's activities actually aren't as are more fixed, if you like. You have to submit certain variants for certain genes, but we feel quite strongly that you should just be able to test the sample for whatever you want to test, and it has to fit in with your processes. So really, we are the only provider of this, but we do ourselves have to meet a set of standards. Uh, but there is no network, if you like, of, of EQA providers working together to deliver this, in, except in this circumstance. Can I just ask, you mentioned very briefly at the start the importance of reference material. Mm. How um, important is complete, accurate, you know, reference material with respect to this QA process? It's, when we first started out, we, we thought it was very important mm. because we thought we had, to, we've, we went back from the premise of what we always do is we work from, we all understand what we're sending out. So we needed to know what the reference was. Now, it's not easy on this. And as you saw that, you know, the four, four providers, four manufacturers only produced a data set of 15,000 overlapping variants that we were confident in. Uh, what we've realized, though, as time's gone by, is that the, 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 the power is in the number. So we have 350 plus submissions for the germline scheme. When you start to get to that scale of laboratory submissions, all using different sequences and different platforms and uh, different kits, etc. you start to realize that there's more power in the data that have been generated by the laboratories. So effectively, we can rewrite our own reference sequence every time we run the EQA on every sample. We don't need to do the prior validation. And we start to gen gen generate data there that allows us to write a new reference sequence for every sample. I think that's really useful because we could potentially test, for example, sending around the genome in the bottle sample to every laboratory and see how good our data analysis is compared to the genome in the bottle sample. Um, I'm not going to say we're going to do that, but that's something we could potentially do. Um, but for us, an EQA provider, we needed a mechanism for doing that because we can't afford to sequence the, the death out of a sample every time we want to provide it. Thank you. Um, to follow up on that, we know the manufacturers and the kits have a bias in what they sequence. Mm -hmm. And you showed that your submitters have a bias in the machines they're using. Mm -hmm. Do you run the risk of your self-referenced material contains a bias which then biases against your smaller providers? So if, there's, if Illumina has a bias, will you see the iron torrent data calling different to that? So you're quite right to flag up bias. That's that's no doubt there's a bias in there, but then there's a bias for everybody's data because we're all using just two manufacturers' platforms, essentially. So we're, even the genome in the bottle data is bias in it, introduced by the sequencing technology used to it. 
Um, I think we are reducing the bias in there because we're using a huge number of different tests. So you saw the data on you know, most of its panels, but there are genomes and exomes in there. I think that's why I'm trying to encourage, if you like, a larger community of laboratories to feed into this process. I think the power is in the numbers. The more laboratories, the more different approaches we see. I'd like to see more data submitted, for example, from uh, Complete Genomics or, or, or other organisations that have got different platforms. And then we should start to sort of iron out some of the inconsistencies, but we'll never get rid of all the bias. And there will always be bias in everything we do. And, and there is already in the genome in the bottle reference material. So, yeah. So um, I have a sort of a similar question, and that was, um, um, so when we've looked with the platinum genome, for example, um, that was sequenced in a similar way, and it used the consensus, mm -hmm. we still find plenty of variants in there that weren't called in the platinum genome. Yeah. So the ones that are called, that true set's quite good, and so I guess you could mm -hmm. use that to define your, um, your false negative rate. So what do you do about this, about the false positive rate? Can you get a good handle of that using this consensus method? Yeah, it's a big debate. Um, we haven't really hit upon the the the, the 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 perfect solution for it yet. I think we will be able to get a handle on it, but we are currently still debating about the best way of doing that. And in fact, we're going. We we I haven't got the data to show you from this year's this year's EQA, but we certainly have seen a probably higher false positive rate than we would like to see. Uh, we're hoping to come back and try and reduce that next time, next time round. I think actually having looked at that, that paper published by the German, the, uh, I keep saying the German Health Alliance, but the, the G4H, PH, whatever it was, uh, is helpful because, again, it's set a set of standards and tools that we can start to look at our data and compare it against theirs. But, yes, it is a problem. I agree, yeah. So what are the range of variants that are within that one sample? Are they predominantly single nucleotide variants or are there any complex? We haven't gone up to big, comp big, big copy number variants. So we're looking at introducing copy number variants into it for, this, for 2018. So we've really just mainly settled on single nucleotide cha changes or small indels. Of course, it depends on how you say small, but yeah. Can I just have a, another little appeal? Is can you add more tumor normal paired tests? I see you've got one on your website at the moment. Do you plan to expand those tests and have? In what rate? respect? Sorry. Have we're in somatic sequencing where both a tumor and a germline yeah. are sequenced together? Yeah. Um, we do that. We send out a match match germline with so it. So I saw. I see one on your website. Is is that correct, or is there more than one one of these? It's things? one. It's, it's only one next generation sequencing scheme. So it would be one sample. I mean, interestingly, we tested it last year. We, we've used reference materials in the past. This year, we used a, a, a real cancer cell line. And uh, without looking at the sample, we could tell what type of tumour it was from all the data we got back from the laboratory. So we could see HER2 amplification, for example. We knew it was a breast cancer cell line. And lo and behold, it was a breast cancer cell line. So it's quite interesting to looking at the data in that context. I was going to ask, just ask one question. It's really, so this has been, i just interested to know the acceptance of QA amongst all the laboratories. I mean, obviously, not obviously, but you know, America, you don't actually have much coverage there. <laughs> um, maybe South America. Um, are, they, are they because of uh, competitors or they, other countries haven't sort of accepted this sort of uh, QA? Uh, America's a closed book. So the College of American Pathology is both the regulator and the provider of EQA. Um, so it's very hard to break into that market. I should say no more. Um, in Canada, the, most of the laboratories, in fact, in, in North America were Canadian laboratories. There's only one American, North, uh, USA laboratory. Uh, we see actually quite a large number of labs from, in a lot of our activities from South America. There's a big growing demand of testing in South America. Um, but yeah, it's really to do with the fact that it's, it's a closed book in the States. Any other questions? If not, I'll close the Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Simon. Thank you.
Thank you everyone for coming along. Thank you Simon for coming and presenting to us and thank you Val for arranging this, um, this visit from Simon. Um, you're all invited to have a little bit of a cup of tea and uh, a scone or something out in the foyer and, um, and have a chat about um, issues facing uh, quality assurance in this space. So anyway, thanks again. Thank you.